Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have you all back in again today, and uh, my, we're, uh, we're growing little by little. Our uh, studio audience is just getting a little larger. It won't be long, we're going to have to buy more tables and chairs and uh, just keep moving it back. But how we thank the Lord and we thank the Lassie people for this new studio facility and uh, makes it possible for us to come back again and have tables and chairs. You all appreciate that, don't you? Yeah. It's so much nicer than getting crammed in there with, uh, without benefit of tables. All right, for all of those of you that are joining us on television, wherever you are, we uh, just want you to feel welcome to be a part of our class. We are not associated with any group. That doesn't mean that I am not of a background, but uh, we don't, uh, what shall I say, we don't try to uh, put forward any one group. I don't attack anyone, hopefully. I certainly don't want to. And uh, our whole purpose has just simply been over the years to teach the Word, let the chips fall where they may. And again, I never mind if people will disagree over certain things. That's their privilege, and I don't get angry when they do. But all I say is, if you're going to disagree, you better be able to do it scripturally and not just because of what some denomination may teach. And uh, so that's been my premise now for these many years that we've been teaching outside of the church environment. And of course, the reason I, I found you have to do this is because everybody has become so denominationally minded that uh, if, uh, if I were to have a class in a Baptist church, nobody comes but Baptists. When I have it in a Methodist church, nobody comes but the Methodists. And uh, so I've learned that if you're going to reach across all these various barriers, you, you have to stay on neutral ground. And uh, that's the way I've tried to keep the program. We, we want to keep it totally neutral. I'm not going to promote any one group or attack another. We're just simply going to teach the Word as we feel the Spirit has led us to teach it. Again, we always like to thank our television audience for your prayers, your financial help, as well as all of your interesting letters. Uh, I guess I, I'm going to have to start reminding people now as our ministry grows and our mail bag gets larger, confine your letters to a page because uh, if we have to start reading two, three, four page letters, it does take a lot of time. So uh, I don't want to discourage you from writing, but uh, keep them short to the point and uh, it'll help us in the use of our time. Now all of our past programs are available on video in the audio cassette package as well as the little printed books. And so if you're interested in any of those things, you call us or drop us a note. Okay, now like we said before, this is a Bible study and uh, we want to buy up the time. We're not here to preach at you. I'm not an evangelist and uh, we'll leave that up to those fellas, but we're just going to teach the Word because uh, we're finding out from every background imaginable that they know so little of the Scriptures. They are so inept at comparing Scripture with Scripture. And uh, hopefully we're, we're making a little headway in that regard. All right, now back to, again, where we were in our last program. We'll drop in at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We left off at verse 8 where I said, you know, that Paul comes the closest to bringing in a little bit of the Old Testament prophecy concerning the wrath and the vexation or the day of the Lord as we pointed out several programs back when we went back all the way from Isaiah up through the Old Testament, all those references using the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is awful. The day of the Lord is the wrath and the judgment of God upon Christ rejecting mankind, upon empires and governments and kings and presidents and so forth who have been flaunting They've literally been flaunting the things of God. All right, so verse 8 here again. Paul is alluding to that Old Testament format of the day of the Lord when he will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction 
from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's their eternal doom. Now, someone just called early this morning, and their question on the phone was, does Paul ever teach hellfire or the lake of fire as we see in Revelation? No, he doesn't use the term explicitly, but he certainly warns people over and over of their lost estate and the doom that's awaiting them. Just because he doesn't use the language, the lake of fire, doesn't mean that he has now superseded it somehow or other. All right, and here's a good example. That's what made me think of it. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. In other words, separation from God, see? And from the presence of the Lord. And after all, that's what's going to make eternity for the lost so awful. Uh, it isn't that they're going to be singed with the fire. I don't think that's it at all. Uh, the hell fire is, is just simply the, the awfulness of being totally separated from God. Now, of course, they're going to be tormented. We know that. The scripture is explicit. And uh, we got just a little foreview of that back in Luke's gospel with the rich man when he was conversing with Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. And he says, I am tormented in this flame. So definitely there is that aspect. But the greatest part of the torment of the lost that will go out into eternity without Christ is that they are separated from the presence of the Lord without hope. All right, let's drop down to verse 10. When he shall come, that is his second coming now in accordance with prophecy is what we're dealing with first. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that what? Believe. See how simple Paul always keeps it? That salvation is to them that believe because our testimony among you was believed. And after all, when Paul came into these pagan cities and approached these pagan Gentiles, he didn't come in with a great Madison Avenue format. He didn't make them jump through hoops. He didn't go down and put on a dog and pony show, as they like to say. He didn't do out of all these things to draw the crowds. He just simply, wherever he met a group of people, he presented Christ crucified, risen from the dead. And from that simple approach, you see, these little cells of believers. Now, they weren't by the thousands. I trust you know that. None of Paul's little congregation were thousands of people. They were relatively small, and most of them meeting in homes. But nevertheless, the overall result was, as it says in the book of Acts, they turned the then known world upside down. And so he did it by just simply presenting the gospel. And that's all he asked his pagan people to do. Believe it. Trust it. And when your faith is manifested, then God does the work of redemption, the life changing, and so on and so forth. All right. Now then, verse 11. I'm in a hurry. I want to get down to chapter 2. Now, verse 11. Wherefore also we pray, Paul says, always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Now listen, when he speaks of power here, he's not talking about tremendous supernatural miracles. The supernatural miracle was that these pagans could come out of their idolatry and their worship of the gods and goddesses and place their faith in Paul's gospel. That's what's the power that was manifested. And that wasn't easy. They probably lost contact with a lot of their friends and relatives because of this newfound faith. And so the power of God was manifested not in supernatural events around them, but in their own transformed lives, where all of a sudden now they had nothing more to do with pagan temple sacrifices, nothing more to do with the gross immorality of those pagan temples. And so it was the work of faith with power. Now here it comes in verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ 
may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace. See, now these people didn't deserve it any more than we do. But it was the grace of God that was poured out on these pagan Thessalonians that they became believers and they were transformed and they became then a tremendous witness and testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now we're going to go into chapter 2. And immediately, the apostle brings in something that he's been leading up to now in these earlier verses, where he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But now you see there is a direct departure from uh, uh, alluding to the second coming, as all of the Old Testament does, and now he's coming to something that was a Pauline revelation, and that is that Christ would only come to the air and he would gather the believers unto himself. Now, the other night I used the analogy again. I think I've even used it on the program, and I still think it's a pretty good one. It's enough to make you smile, but uh, I think it's a good analogy. And we've all seen in, in a movie or a TV program or something where one thing or another will lead you out to the old junkyard, to the old uh, salvage yard, where they've got this huge electromagnet. And you've all seen it. And they can just swing. In fact, uh, I think my daughter went up to a salvage yard a while back, and she was looking for something. And uh, the guy in that electromagnet just gave her an exhibition of what he could do. And she said it was amazing. He could just take that great big magnet and swing it over on a little tiny piece of iron, pick it up, and he could take that thing and sling it halfway across the salvage yard. Well, she got a big kick out of that, of what a man can do when he's got that kind of expertise. But any of all seen pictures, how that great, huge electromagnet can just go out over all that metal, wrecked cars or whatever the case may be in that salvage yard, and all he has to do is turn the switch in his cab. And what happens? All that metal just flies up to that magnet. Well, now that's the way I like to picture the, the rapture. Christ is going to come to the air, and just like a great magnet, he's going to pull us all up into his presence. And uh, again, you know, I, I like to keep these things where once in a while you can smile. And uh, I think I've shared on the program, and I did again the other night in one of our classes. I said, now the, the world is round. If the Lord comes from our perspective, the people on the other part of the globe are going to have to go a little further. They're going to have to come around the, the edges, but nevertheless, we're all going to meet the Lord in the air, wherever it is. And this is what he's talking about. He's not talking about when Christ comes to the Mount of Olives. See, this is what you have to notice in Scripture, the change in language. We're not talking now about Christ coming to the Mount of Olives. We're not talking about Christ coming in wrath and uh, attending judgment, but instead, for us, it's just simply a gathering together to meet him in the air, as he said in 1 Thessalonians 4, as we saw a few weeks back. All right? So he says, We beseech you by the coming of our Lord and by our gathering together unto him. Now, that's the language I want you to keep in your computer. Our gathering unto him. Now, verse 2 that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, now that's a small s, so that is by their own spirit or an outside spirit, not the Holy Spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. Now what does that indicate? Among all the other things that Paul had to constantly deal with, there were people forging his name and sending these forged letters to his congregations to confuse the issue, see? And so he had to put up with that. And so he's telling these Thessalonians, now don't pay any attention to a forged letter as from us, as that the day of the Lord is at hand. Now you're going to look up and you say, but my Bible says the day of Christ. Well, I'll probably get some mail on this, but everybody that I've ever read have all agreed that this is one place where our King James has an error. Now, some of these people are going to get all shook up. 
But I always have to remind folks, remember, the King James is not the original manuscript. The original manuscripts had no error. But the King James is still a translation, and there can be an error. And here is probably one of the most profound, because all are agreed that in the light of all the language around it, this should be the day of the Lord, which that's why we pointed them all out coming up through the Old Testament. The day of the Lord is the day of wrath and vexation and judgment and the horrors of the tribulation, ending with, Christ's second coming to the Mount of Olives. That's the day of the Lord. The day of Christ is what we call the rapture, the resurrection day for the church. And so regardless of how somebody may oppose that, I'm going to stick to my guns that in light of all that surrounds this verse, this should have been the day of the Lord. All right? And he says, don't be shaken. In other words, what, he, what is Paul implying? Paul is implying that due to the tremendous amount of pressure and persecution that these new believers were coming under, and in light of his teaching, which we're going to see in a few verses, he covered the whole nine yards in those first three or four weeks that he was with them. And so they understood this coming day of wrath. They knew there was a tribulation period coming. And what do you suppose they were beginning to think? That they were in it. See? That they were in it. And evidently, some of these forged letters and some of these false teachers were coming in and telling them that. Well, listen, the reason you're suffering, we're in the tribulation. And then these forged letters would come in and tell them, well, bear up, because after all, this is the wrath and vexation of the day of the Lord. Paul said, don't you buy that. Don't you believe any of that stuff. Because we're not in the day of the Lord. You haven't missed the rapture. You know, I, I think every believer in his life that understands the rapture at any one time has happened to all of us. That you come home and you expect your whole family to be there and they're all gone. Nobody's home. And what's the first thought that hits you? <laughs> the Lord came. <laughs> See? The Lord came. Well... The Thessalonians were in the same situation. They thought the Lord had come and they'd what? They'd missed it, see? And so Paul is writing now to comfort them that no, you haven't missed it. This isn't the tribulation. This is not the day of the Lord, see? And now look at the next verse. Let no man what? Don't let any man deceive you. Don't let someone come along and tell you that the day of Christ has already happened and you're in the day of the Lord. Because he said the day of the Lord cannot happen until. And what's the until? That day shall not come. That is the day of the Lord. The day of judgment. The seven years of tribulation. Paul writes so clearly that cannot come except there come and I'm going to use what I think is a better translation again than the King James. And that is the departure. That day of judgment cannot come until the departure. Now, the word apostasia is the Greek word from which our King James and other translations have gotten the term the falling away, which of course is appropriate. But there is another Greek word. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, so I'm going to have to look at this little one and, and see if I can... The, the cognate verb of the word apostasia is aphistome. And that is translated in several other places in the New Testament as departing from one place to another. And I've mentioned it before in the program, the earlier translations before the 1611 King James, the Tyndale and the Geneva and a couple other earlier translations did use the departure. It's in there as plain as day that this day of the Lord cannot come until there is the departure. And this Greek word, af, aphistome, has the little Greek letter ahead of it that indicates the article the. 
And so the Greek implies the departure. Now, again, I think it's just like we can change some of our words by just adding an L-Y. In other words, you can have the verb happy, and it's a verb. Someone is happy. And you just simply add an L-Y and you make it a what? An adverb. And then the word becomes happily. You see that? Now, it's the same way with this Greek word. It is so closely related that you're not doing any injustice to the Greek or anything else to use the translation, the departure. And so let no man deceive you, Paul says, by any means for that day of the Lord. See, that's why it wouldn't fit to have the day of Christ up there in verse 2. For that day, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the day of wrath, shall not come except or until there comes the departure. Now this fits with everything else that Paul writes. Remember we saw last month in our four programs that back in 1 Thessalonians, Paul told us, we're not appointed to wrath. We're not appointed to the judgment, the vexation. We've been saved out of all that. And so you have to keep everything in context. And so he is absolutely right in saying here then that the day of judgment cannot begin until there is the departure first. And then what happens next? That the man of sin be revealed. All right, now let's go over to 1 John chapter 2, the little epistles of John to the right. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 18. And believe it or not, as far as I can tell, this is the only place in Scripture where this man of sin is called the Antichrist. And I always have to qualify the word Antichrist. It does not mean the man who is against Christ. That's our normal interpretation. But the term Antichrist means the counterfeit Christ. The counterfeit. And the world is going to buy that. The world, and especially Israel, they're going to immediately, when they see what this man does by bringing peace to the Middle East, they're, no, they're going to acclaim him as the Christ. And that's why we'll see in a little bit in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, he appears as a what? Riding on a white horse. Well, according to symbolism, who is really going to come on the white horse? The true Christ. And so this man of sin, the Antichrist, will not be an opposer per se. He's going to be a counterfeit. All right, now look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, where John writes, little children. And you remember John, again, I think, like First and Second Peter, writes primarily to Jews who will be in the tribulation. And so he is writing appropriately. Little children, it is the last time. Absolutely it is. And as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. Now remember, he's writing to Jews specifically, I feel, who will be feasting on these little verses from 1st and 2nd and 3rd John during the tribulation in particular. All right, now flip over to chapter 4, honey. Chapter 4, verse 3. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of what? Antichrist. Whereof you have heard that it should come, but it's already in the world. The spirit of Antichrist has been here ever since the beginning of the garden experience, because after all, 
Who is behind the Antichrist? Well, Satan. It's satanic power. And so the Antichrist is consequently then called all these other terms, as he calls him here, come back to 2 Thessalonians for just a moment, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he is called not only the man of sin, up there in verse 3, that man of sin would be revealed, but he's also called what? The son of perdition. Now there's only one other person in all of human history that was called that. Who was it? Judas. Judas was called the son of perdition, and you know what he was? He was indwelt by Satan. So will this man. Not the first three and a half years, but the second three and a half. He will be indwelt by Satan the same as Judas was. All right, now in order to establish, I don't think I got much time in this half hour, only two minutes left. All right, come back with me to Daniel. And the Anytime I teach something concerning prophecy, I always like to show where we have our foundation for teaching these things. I mean, you can't just pull it out of the woodwork, and uh, you can't just hopscotch through Scripture, but you come back to Daniel, who the Lord Jesus himself called a prophet. Now, maybe that takes some explanation. Why am I making the point? Because there are so many, especially of higher criticism, who maintain that Daniel is a forgery, that due to the explicit accuracy of Daniel's prophetic utterances, it must have been written after the fact and then forged. That's what the higher critics like to do. See, they like to take away all the inspiration. They like to take away the supernatural idea of our scriptures. And uh, that's one way they can do it. But the Lord Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, verse 15, that when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and if you can't believe the words of the Lord Jesus, we might as well take this book and throw it away and go home. Because after all, he's the author of the whole thing. And he calls Daniel a prophet. Now I only got 30 seconds. I might as well just wind up this half hour. So we're going to go back in our next program now and see from the prophet Daniel the very first portion of Scripture that delineates one man as becoming the great world ruler, the man of sin. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries. Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.